Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Neil. I am with bikepacking.com and welcome to our live stream. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it's super exciting. Um, we just recently launched this bikepacking.com YouTube channel probably a month ago now. Um, it's been kind of slow and steady at the beginning, but we have some, bit, some big visions for it. Um, and you've basically seen that already, and this is just an extension of that. So we're super excited to, uh, to bring this to you. Um, this is What's in Your Bag, and uh, this is a four-part series uh, in which we are going to basically unpack our bikepacking bags for you. We're going to kind of show you what kind of uh, gear is in the said bag, uh, why we store it there, and um, we'll probably just... Uh, share some tips and tricks along the way. Um, so without further ado, I have some awesome guests here with me, uh, Miles Arbor, Jess Daddio, and Joe Cruz. Um, so Miles, let's just start with you. Um, where are you from? Where do you live now? And um, what was your first bikepacking trip ever and your recent, most recent bikepacking trip? Okay, um, I'm Miles, I'm from Canada. Um, I grew up in Ontario, but right now I'm on the West Coast, house sitting on Vancouver Island. Um, then uh, most re recent or first bikepacking trip was um, in college. Um, I got turned on to bikepacking in a guide trading program that I went to after university. And I had a gravel bike and I got a bunch of stuff in some dry bags and then zip tied them kind of all over the bike. I had something zip tied sort of where frame bag would be. I had something zip tied on the front and then something under the saddle. And it, it worked okay. Um, we didn't end up staying the night anywhere and we went home early. <laughs> um, most recent trip, I've just been doing a lot of day riding recently, to be honest, like long day rides. Mm -hmm. um, so most of the summer I was, I was doing trips because um, I was in the van traveling throughout the U.S., so scouting trips along the way. Um, I guess the most recent actual bike pack trip would be scouting uh, the couch in figure eight loop that we published on the website. So that was also on Vancouver Island, um, leaves right from downtown Victoria, which is pretty rad. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you. And um, you said you were house sitting right now. Yeah. So, but you're also working on something else, right? Other than biking consistently. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I write with uh, bikepacking.com. Um, so I manage the events calendar there and then uh, a lot of the news and uh, gear reviews as well. Awesome. <laughs> cool. All right, Jess, uh, how about you? Okay, my name's Jess Stadio. I'm from Virginia, and I still currently live in Virginia in Harrisonburg, which is a lot of great mountain biking and road riding and gravel riding, especially. Um, my first, let's see, first bikepacking trip was um, in 2016, and I did maybe 50 miles with some friends. I didn't even have a seat pack. I had a really heavy backpack. And I had some dry bags because I was a raft guide at the time. And I just took some cam straps and put them on my handlebars, had a heavy backpack. It took us two days to do 50 miles. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, my recent, most recent bikepacking trip was last September. I did the Trans Virginia, which is a newer 550 mile gravel route from Washington, D.C. to kind of the Virginia, Tennessee border. So yeah. Awesome. Cool. Mr. Cruz, Joe Cruz. Neil, thanks for having me here. Thanks yeah. for putting this together. And I'm, I'm psyched to be in this illustrious company. I'm Joe Cruz. I live part of the time in the great state of Vermont, where I am right now. Uh, for our international viewers, Vermont is in the northeastern part of the USA, north of New York City and, and a little west of Boston, if those are landmarks for you. I spend half the time, though, in New York City, I was born there and, and think of myself as a New Yorker. And of course, uh, these days, so many of, of my friends, shout out to my friends in New York City, so many of my friends are reporting their experiences in, in New York City, which can be difficult. So always in, always in our hearts around here. I teach at Williams College. I'm a philosophy professor about 10K away from where I am now. 
that 10K crosses a border. So I'm a professor in Massachusetts. I live half the time in Vermont. I'm from New York City and I live there the other half the time. My first bikepacking trip was in 1988. And that was a trip where we'd heard, uh, some friends and I had heard that folks were riding bicycles around a track called the White Rim Trail in Utah. At the time I was living in New England and we rode a train. We packed up our bikes, I had an, an old GT to Cuesta. We packed up our bikes, we borrowed kit from, from the college outing club. We rode a train from, from Albany to Chicago and then Chicago to Utah, got off the train and, and rode, rode to Canyonlands National Park and did a circuit of White Rim and then spent some time in, in Moab. Uh, feels like a long time ago. That was a great trip. And then my most recent trip was with, with bikepacking.com. I'm a, an, on the editorial team of bikepacking.com and Logan Watts created a set of routes down in Colombia that we could share with the, the Office of Conservation International down in Bogota in collaboration with the office in the USA to increase awareness of some of the fragile landscapes and, and to, to transform some of the attitudes about those landscapes toward recreation and uh, conservation rather than the encroachment of, of farms. And that was a really, that was a terrific trip. That was in January. And even then we were hearing about coronavirus. So it, it remains in my imagination for uh, something that I've been able to do recently and before this lockdown. Uh, it's a special trip and, and we had a good time there. Awesome. Well, that's, yeah. And I think it's, uh, it should be said, obviously, this is, this is a very difficult time to, uh, to be bikepacking anyways. And so um, that's kind of one of the reasons what spurred the, not only this live session, but even just the YouTube channel in general. Um, so yeah, just, I want to give my thanks to all of the healthcare workers out there. Um, all the people on the front lines, uh, you guys are the true heroes right now. And, um, and we couldn't do it without you. So um, especially in New York. All right. Um, so let's get on to it. So basically tonight we are going to talk about um, seat packs or even rack systems. Uh, this is going to be a four part series. Uh, so we're going to talk every Thursday for the next four Thursdays. Uh, next week is going to be frame bags. The week after that is going to be handlebar bags. And then um, I think it's May 21st. We're going to talk about what's in our cockpit and then some, some items that we actually carry uh, on our bodies, like backpacks or fanny packs or whatnot. So, um, yeah, so tonight we're going to start with seat packs uh, or rack systems. Um, and I guess I didn't mention um, myself. I'm Neil Belchenko. I, uh, uh, I kind of want to play along too. So, um, I, uh, um, uh, I'm from originally from Chicago, Illinois, big white Sox fan. Um, I, uh, I lived in Colorado, uh, Crested Butte Gunnison area for basically, uh, 10, 11 years. And then I most recently moved to Minneapolis, uh, just shy of two years ago now. Um, so I've been here ever since then. And, um, yeah, it's tonight. Today is great because it's like seventy degrees and sunny and awesome. But uh, it's normally kind of cold, and at least in the spring. Um, so my first bikepacking trip uh, was uh, two thousand and twelve. I pedaled the Colorado Trail with a friend. Um, it was a very ambitious first bikepacking trip. Uh, we had some 26 inch Trek fuels, both of us. So they were actually really awesome bikes for the trail, um, but they uh, they weren't necessarily like bike packing bikes. Even though a bike packing bike can be any bike, um, it wasn't as suited for, uh, for bike packing. And um, so yeah, basically we, uh, we finished in 10 days, just over like 70 miles a day or so. And it was a pretty, pretty awesome, awesome experience. Uh, and I was kind of hooked after that. And then, uh, most recently I actually, uh, squeezed in an overnighter last week. Um, just, uh, out to a, out to a park, um, west of Minneapolis. All right. So that's us. Thanks for being here, everyone. Yeah. 
Um, all right, so Miles, I guess uh, let's start with you. What, um, I guess, what what rack or what system are you using? Um, I, maybe what the what is the capacity of the system and what's in it and why do you use it? Okay, um, so the system I'm gonna be looking at is just one of many systems that I use. Um, I definitely don't use the same system every time, um, nor do I pack everything inside of it the same way every time. Um, it's usually kind of last minute, um, just like today was. Um, but this setup is something that got inspired from uh, Skyler, actually, who has done some work for bikepack.com in the past. Um, and it's pretty much a minimal rear rack setup. So this is the tumbleweed uh, T-rack. Mm. And then it has a dry bag strapped onto the top with it with, with fillet straps. So the big, I think the 24 inch fillet straps. Um, and that's it. So there's no um, there's no special gear here really, um, besides the rack, I guess, which is kind of minimal just to keep the weight down. And then the dry bag, this one specifically is a double-ended one from Porcelain Rocket. Um, so, but any dry bag would work obviously. Um, yeah. Um, I would use this mostly on like a hardtail mountain bike. Um, the reason I use this setup, which I find it's cool, is that it keeps the weight like as low as you possibly can get it. So lower than any 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 traditional kind of saddlebag that you can have. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really good for riding off road. Um, and on single track and stuff, I think it, it keeps the weight in like the best possible position. Um, yeah. Awesome. And um, do you ever fear you might break the rack? I think that might be the biggest question I've always had when using a rack. Yeah, I just, this thing's pretty bomber. Um, mm -hmm. So it's super well built. I honestly don't think that it's going to break on me. Um, the only thing I've been worried about is the bolts loosening up mm -hmm. just on the bike itself, everything rattling around all day. But put some Loctite on there and make sure you're using some pretty like solid uh, hardware. And I think it should be fine. It hasn't, hasn't messed up on me yet. And I used this setup in Arkansas with Joe on a scouting trip that we did. And there was some pretty like rough terrain. And I don't think I had any issues during that. Um, just my tires are going all flat every day, but that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what, um, what bike, I forgot to ask, what bike is this on again? Um, so anything with rear rack mounts, but currently I've been using on my YS7. Okay, cool. And you're going to, throughout the next month or so, you'll be talking about your, your whole system on the YS7. Yeah. It'll pretty much be a mirror image of what I packed during, um, the Arkansas trip. So the, yeah. Cool. Which is a hardtail mountain bike, titanium mountain bike from Y Cycles. Correct. Cool. Sweet. Um, should we unpack or should we just go? How do you guys want to do this? I think we should unpack and then okay. do one at a time. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Um, What's in that thing? I'll show you. All right. Unpacking is simple, which is another benefit. You just take off the volet straps. Now it's free from the rack. Um, so. This isn't packed in any particular order, um, but usually I'm packing stuff in this kind of system, um, but it's stuff that I don't need throughout the day. Um, Cause as soon as you kind of unleash this dry bag, um, everything sort of falls out. So right now I have a summer weight quilt. Um, so the Western Mountaineer Nano Light as quilt. So a super lightweight quilt, only good for summertime. Um, don't need that throughout the day at all. I usually have a warm layer. Uh, so this is a uh, Primaloptic synthetic insulation jack from Outdoor Research that I usually bring along. It has some uh, breathable material under the armpit. So riding in it is pretty comfortable, but it provides enough warmth for like kind of summertime, summertime riding. What else do we have in here? Camp pillow, don't go anywhere without it. I'm actually looking for a more comfortable one. So if anyone has any sweet camp pillows that are like a little bit better than just like an air blow up one, then I'll take it. And then sort of the last thing that I'd bring in here um, is like camp clothes. Um, so I usually have a few spare clothes, depending on the length of the trip, just to wear at camp, be more comfortable and to sleep in. I love these little, um, they're just kind of like a rain pant. I, or not a rain pant, sort of like a swimming short without a liner, maybe. And they dry super quick. Like I can swim in them and they'll be dry before morning for sure. 
uh, some camp socks, something to sleep in so I don't get a sleeping bag all gross, and then another wool t-shirt uh, for at camp. And that's pretty, that'd be pretty standard, a pretty standard setup for me. Just stuff that I don't need throughout the day. It's all just staying in that dry bag. Um, you also notice that I didn't use any like compression sacks or anything. So I never, at first, kind of when I got into outdoorsy stuff back in the day, every, everyone was all about like compression sacks, getting things like super tiny. I find it makes, I find personally, it makes kind of like bricks that are sort of hard to shape into places. So I've just resorted to stuffing everything in loose. Yeah. Um, I do that with my tent as well. But I think that kind of helps for this sort of setup because you really, as soon as, if this thing was like packed with a bunch of sort of melon shaped items, it'd be really hard to cinch down and it'd kind of be flopping around, um, especially because it doesn't have any sort of form like a normal saddlebag does. Uh, so I really want it to be like nice and tight. And uh, yeah, that's the minimalist rack dry bag setup. Sweet. I like it. Thanks, me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jess, let's uh, let's hear about your setup. What uh, first off, what bike are you using, and um, and what's your your rear uh, saddle uh, pack system? So I, for most of my tours, take um, my steel Salsa Fargo, and I bought this after that first bike packing trip. It's the Revelate, like maybe the first or second version of the Revelate Terrapin system. You can see my nice uh, duct tape job here. Mm. Got a little uh, seat rub issue, which I've, uh, I'll go into, I guess, about why I don't pack a lot in this. Um, but yeah, so this is a 14 liter. Like I said, it's probably one of the first or second iterations of it. Um, and it's held up pretty well, seat, um, tire rub and all. So um, yeah, I can kind of unpack it. Yeah, yeah, let's see what's in there. Most of it is just uh, my tent situation and my pot. So mm. I really like this because it has the valve and I find that's really like clutch for getting a good tight pack. And that's the, the what is that called? The, uh, um, the air valve to re remove all the air in there? Yeah, mm -hmm. I really like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, tent stakes. Um, I put my rain jacket in here just because nothing in here is really like, I don't know, it's all getting dirty and wet all the time. So I just leave that in there in case I need it. If I, if I don't have that in there, I'll have like, I don't know, some rain pants or something else in here. Um, I've got this tent. Um, it's Z-Packs. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Flexible, mm -hmm. super lightweight, Dyneema. Um, it's one person. And I usually have one tent bowl. It's not my seat pack. It's not in my green bag. That's in there. Brown sheet. Tyvek, normally, whatever I got on hand. Mm -hmm. And then my cook system is at the very bottom. And, um, this is uh, kind of really cool, like Primus system. Um, it's the one liter pot. It's their new Trek pot system. Um, and tent and stove, or the uh, stove. And the fuel all fits down in here. And this is their new um, Micron stove. Um, so it's all pretty compact and lightweight. And fits really nicely. And I have to um, fit all of this in the bottom of my seat pack. Just over time, I've found that I have to, I don't know, have like a smaller end to my dry bag so I can really cinch it down there so it doesn't like hit my tire as much. Mm -hmm. So that has like a very designated spot in the seat pack and then I just stuff the tent all around it and it kind of cushions it and I can really cinch it down and, and that's really it. What, uh, is it, that's just an isobutane, um, stove. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, I was curious just uh, what size frame are you on? Like with that, that tire rub, it's a um, it's a small. Okay. Yeah. And it's a, uh, tw is it the Fargo with the 29 plus, uh, wheels on it? It has 20, it came stock with 27.5, but I have okay. controls on it. Okay, now. got it. Yep. Yep. Tire rub. Even with the hardtail, it's, it's, yeah, it's crazy. It's battle. Yep. yep. So, but finally got the system down and it doesn't, if I pack it right and I don't rush through it, it, it goes pretty good. So. Sweet. That's definitely interesting. I haven't like there's everybody does it a little bit differently. I haven't seen the stove in the, uh, in the top of the pack before. That's cool. 
Yeah, it's a very, I have to put it a certain way so that I can just really like cinch that because once that part gets too wide, it just, it's very easy to rub on the mm -hmm. tire. And yeah. If I don't have uh, like enough stuff in the pot, I hate pot gas can rattle. It's like the worst. So I'll put like instant coffee yep. packs in there and like try to seal up all the empty spots. For sure. But, um, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks, Jess. Uh, how about you, Joe? What are we, what are you, uh, using out in, uh, for a seat pack? Yeah, cool. Uh, Neil, can I, can I share, can I share my screen and, and Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Set up? Let's see. Um, yeah. I'm, I need to find the right window and here it is. Uh, how about that? Boom. So that is your setup, huh? Yeah. So, so I feel like for this conversation, we need to, you know, keep separate different kinds of bikepacking trip. So this is my setup for a, a, a dirt tour or kind of gravel, gravel bike kind of ride where probably the, you know, the, the resupply is pretty frequent and, and part of the experience is passing through places that are culturally meaningful, that are historically meaningful, not, you know, wicked off the grid or the Colorado trail or, or riding in Alaska or, or in Kyrgyzstan or something. And so, so my setup, for for this kind of ride is pretty different from from the setup for a more expedition style and it just seemed like like so many people are doing this kind of ride these days that it would be useful to to share some thoughts about about this sort of setup so that's um that's a steel english custom bike made by my good friend and and famous frame builder rob english out in oregon and this is from a trip uh last year a two-part trip. One was one part of it was in Bosnia, and then another part was from from Munich to to Marseille. So so those are places where again resupply is is readily available. So you can go with this super light lightweight kind of kind of um, abbreviated setup. And so what I want to show you, I, I guess I can stop sharing that. Mm -hmm. What I want to show you is is um, a little bit of history. So. Uh, I'm, I'm a Revelate ambassador, and of course that means that Eric, uh, Eric up in Alaska, Eric Parsons, hi Eric, I hope you're tuning in, Eric, and Eric sent me some great stuff, but I, I went back to, to my emails to check to see when I ordered this Viscacha, and this is from 2010, so we're at 10 years on this pack, and I still pretty frequently use this pack because I like it and it's got some it's got some uh, patina to it, and and in that image that that you saw of of my Rob English bike, uh, I had this this kind of pack, or maybe I had the black one. But anyway, I had this kind of pack, and it's super versatile space because it's unstructured, and if you pack it right, you can you can get away with its um you know maybe its old school design uh, with a decade of innovation on this kind of this this kind of setup, I, I feel like the modern packs like Jess's Terrapin or or you know any of the any of the beautiful packs that are out there, Porcelain Rocket or Ortlieb or or any of the packs, they've achieved a level of sophistication and design beauty that maybe you don't find in this in this ten years ago thing. But I still love it. So thanks, Eric, for this. Um, and this is I, I guess I, I can say before I before I open it up. I can say that this is um, uh, this also meets a certain aesthetic requirement that I have for the for the bag. That is, it doesn't extend way far out, or you know, even though I could get it to extend way far out from the from the saddle, I prefer that it not do that. I, I sort of like a tighter setup back there, and that keeps mm -hmm. flattening to a minimum for especially for this design. But also, I just think it looks better to to not be telescoping way back behind the behind the saddle. So, Neil, should I open it up? Yeah, let's uh, let's see what's in it. All right, cool. Uh, so, the way I pack, uh, as Miles said, might vary from trip to trip, and might vary from day to day on on any given trip. And and the big factors are what I expect the weather to be, when the next resupply is, and whether I I need to to have quick access to, to items that are, are special for a special occasion. So uh, if, it, if, I, if I know it's going to rain, right, and this is related to weather, if I know it's going to rain, then I want to have my rain gear at the edges of the packs. 
So bikepacking gear is notoriously limited in space and and persnickety about the way you pack it. So if it's going to rain that day, or if there's some chance of inclement weather, you want your, I feel like you want your, your gloves, you want your rain jacket, you want your, your booties at the, at, at places close to the zippers or close to the openings. And what I do for my saddle pack is usually I keep some rain gear right at the edge, right at the, t- that, at the top of this opening. So that if I, if I need to stop for, for, uh, inclement weather, I have ready access to, to stuff that's protective. So the first thing that comes out of this bag is a uh, search and state expedition jacket, uh, waterproof and, and uh, enough of a soft shell kind of design so that it, it provides some warmth. So that's right at the end. I can stop at a moment's notice, unroll the bag, pull this out, close it right back up. My rain gear is not hidden away somewhere. And then I'm, if if it really is inclement, I might reach in the bag again and find uh, my rain pants. These are these are Patagonia uh, Houdini yeah. rain shells, um, really rated only to to rain resistance. But I've always found them adequate for a kind of gravel tour or a or a dirt road sort of tour. If I was on a more expedition type ride, then I might bring something heavier duty. So when Logan and I were in Kyrgyzstan, I brought uh, a, a gore pair of heavier duty pants, but these have, have served well on, on gravel tours. So again, I'm thinking in terms of in terms of needing ready access to stuff out of my pack, rain pants. And likewise, uh, a quick reach into the bag yields Gore-Tex booties. So Gore-Tex booties go inside the shoe and they're great for river crossings and great for keeping your toes warm and dry in a rainstorm. So that's on the assumption that I've awakened that day and I worry that it might be rainy. So I want stuff ready at hand for those kinds of conditions. If it's a sunny day, if I know that that it's going to be dry, this stuff would be deeper in the pack than the stuff I'm about to pull out because it doesn't much matter. And in that case, you're mostly working with trying to give the pack enough of a stable shape so that it doesn't wiggle around too much. And so you can get it really cinched down. So again, in this, in this rear bag, uh, stuff that I, I don't expect to use very often during the day. Um, Oh, here are some, here are some nitrile gloves, which are going to go under my wool gloves. If it's raining, my wool gloves will be in the front of my pack because I'll wear those pretty frequently. But if it's raining, I'll put these nitrile gloves, uh, under the wool gloves and that'll give me some rain resistance. But this isn't used during during the day. It waits for camp. So it's my pot and inside the pot, I'm trying to conserve space, is my Thermarest uh, Neo Air Uber Light. So sleeping pad, pot. Where's the stove? The stove we're gonna talk about when in a couple of weeks when we get to the frame pack because that lives in a different place because it's small and because it fits in in that half frame bag. And next thing out of there is a first aid kit. You hope not to use it, but you want to have it. So that's tucked right along the edge of the bag. Again, you're you're sort of conceiving of it as big central items that then you work around in order to give it stability and a, and a kind of structure because it doesn't have any inherent structure. So uh, uh, a first, first aid kit, a uh, towel, a uh, a microfiber towel, which is going to be used to absorb moisture on the inside of my single wall tent and also be used for uh, the shower if there's such a thing available on the trip. Uh, The lid of the pot, separate from the pot because the lid gets tucked in the edges. You're working around the the central items and so too uh, your wet wipes are getting tucked around the edges. And then finally we're in sort of the the things that that give the the bag the most structure. So here's my tent. Uh, This is a a Six Moons Lunar Solo. The idea for me behind the tent you carry is that if it's a one person tent, it should be about the size of a cantaloupe. So this gets in its own uh, Sea to Summit stuff sack and you sort of shape it to 
go right toward the end of the of the seat pack so that it's one of the one of the dominant supports for the structure of the seat pack. I suppose in here I also have uh, a couple of items that I like to use in the tent. So my tent lights, which plug into a uh, cash battery to relieve my headlamp from a battery load. And there might be a pair of socks in here too. So tent. And then finally, we're reaching the end here. I have some camp slippers. Uh, these are, I think these are fit kicks. And of course they look absurd when they're on you. They're, they're just this kind of a uh, Lycra top attached to a sole. But on the other hand, it's nice to get the feet out of, out of the, the riding shoes at the end of the day. So a pair of fit kicks were along the bottom side of the, of the bag. And now we've reached the very nose of the bag and you want something to give that nose area structure up against the seat post, because if you don't give that a stable structure, it'll collapse into the seat post and start to wiggle around fierce. And so spare tube, again, hoping you need it when you're running tubeless, but you want to have at least uh, at least one along with you, and that's the whole thing. That's um that that's the contents of this rear bag under the theory that all of my spare clothes are going to be in the front bag, and all of the tools and miscellaneous are going to be in the in the frame pack along with any food I'm carrying. So this this setup in the way that I've rolled it allows for some food to go in here, some, some pre-made meals or, or a block of cheese or, or uh, a box of crackers can go into this kind of setup. It extends the bag outward, um, ugly, extends about the bag outward, but on the other hand, it does give you some flexibility in packing for a half day or packing for a day. If I were going to pack for a, a carry in between resupply that might go five or six days. Our longest carry in Kyrgyzstan, for instance, was a six day carry. So it was six days in between time, times we could resupply, then everything would get shifted around. And on that kind of expedition, I'd probably have a flat bar bike. So everything would be in that front roll and all the food would be in the, in the, in the rear uh, Terrapin is how I, how I did it in, in Kyrgyzstan and probably how I do it now. That's wow. it. That's, that's detailed. Um, Sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. That's really, it's really good. I, I want to ask how many days have you stayed outside next to a bike? Like how many, how many days of bike packing did it take you to figure out that system? Well, yeah. Way to remind everybody that I'm way older than all of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So, so look, you know, I started out, uh, using panniers, a, a two rear pannier setup. And I, I see that in some of the com comments folks have asked about pannier setups. And and if if for a second you think the, us over at bikepacking.com are enemies of, of panniers, uh, I mean to tell you that that's not true. I mean, horses for courses, right? So some of the time you need the convenience of panniers. And if you're going into the hostel or if you're carrying a lot of a lot of gear for for inclement weather, you might go for a pannier setup just just to make your life easier. But I transitioned in the you know 2010 2011 on a trip in South America to to the soft bag setup. I was nervous about it for sure. I was I was I was not confident that I could carry everything that I needed to carry. And I was on a fat bike at the time, which was another kind of experiment uh, to take that kind of bicycle uh, far away from from spare fat bike parts, but what I found was week after week and then month after month, I was, I was down there for seven months. You just sort of learn how stuff, how stuff has to fit together. And, and that kind of, you know, it's a sort of pleasure of its own to try to try to puzzle solve for your gear. And that's a long way of saying that, yeah, I started thinking about packing this stuff about 10 years ago. And just recently I feel more confident in, but, you know, waking up, putting it in pretty efficiently and getting on the road and knowing that I know where everything is. Yeah. The, the twinkle lights are a new addition, aren't they, to your setup? It's true. Thanks for, thanks for remembering the twinkle lights. Yeah. So, so Big Agnes makes a string of LED lights that terminates in a USB uh, port. And so I just string those on the tent and that gives me a certain um, festival feeling. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we have a question here that maybe maybe we could all answer this one. Um, yeah. From Zero Fighter Forty Two. That's his birth name. Um, what front slash rear weight balance do you aim for? Um, yeah. Do you want to go ahead, Neil? Well, I, I was gonna. Um, I think that maybe I should dive into mine first, and then because I talk about weight a little bit. Okay, do it then. Should we do that? Okay, cool. So this is my setup. Um, basically, it is on my um, salsa spearfish, which you see right there in the background, um, just in the middle of my living space here. Um, but this is the uh, Revelate Designs Vol. So this is a dropper-specific saddle bag. Uh, this bag is unique because I can use it with a dropper, um, or yeah, a dropper, any dropper really. Um, this, uh, this bag is unique because it uses the wolf tooth design, um, valet, which is this little piece right here. And this piece comes in a 25 millimeter or 26 millimeter clamp diameter. So basically almost all of the dropper posts out there have 25 or 26 mil diameters, but now there's a bunch of, uh, smaller ones on gravel bikes. Um, but they don't have one for that. You could also just use some sort of like a rubber clamp or shim. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, so this bag is about seven liters and um, it's definitely specific for dropper posts. Um, so I use it on a full suspension bike. Um, it does not fit that much. Obviously uh, at seven liters, it will not fit as much as Joe's, any, any of your setups, to be honest. Um, but that's what you kind of get for when you, uh, or what you get for when you're uh, actually using a full suspension bike, because the key is you still want to use that rear travel um, and still maintain, or at least use this type of space on the back end of the bike. So this is definitely the best case scenario. Um, sometimes I have had to double up this uh, or stack two valets right here um, to avoid hitting the um, the under underside of the bag on my rear tire. It really depends on your your bike. It depends on um, how steep or uh, slack your seat tube is. Um, and also it depends on how tall you are um, and what size bike you're on, what size inseam you have. It's just kind of a rabbit hole. Um, if you can make it work, great. Even if you're just using, I don't know, like 50 millimeters of your dropper post still, I think it's still worth it. Um, the valet does take up 25 millimeters of your dropper. So that's something to think about. Um, and sometimes if you stack them, you can end up using 50 millimeters of a hundred mil dropper. Um, so that's a lot of numbers who really cares. Um, <laughs> let's just unlock, uh, unpack it. And, um, I'll just kind of show you what's in it. So basically for this, this specific setup, um, would be for summer bike packing on single track. So like Colorado trail, Oregon timber trail. I did a trip last year in Washington where we hiked our bike up, um, all these moto trails just so we could get some really epic descents, um, down moto trails. They're just super rough and rugged. So this whole system, um, is basically just my sleep system and it's super minimal. There's not much in it. Um, so I've got my big Agnes, uh, sleeping pad. This is a, um, the shortest version, the rectangle, the 60 by 22. Uh, that's all I need. Um, if I could go smaller, I would, uh, but that's one of the smaller ones out there, uh, that actually is insulated still. And then I have a, my tent, which is, um, a big Agnes tiger wall platinum two. So it's a two person tent. I typically end up so I'm just actually stuffing all of this stuff in here. There's no extra dry bag or anything like that. Um, this bag is, uh, this sleeping bag is nice because I can actually share it with someone or it's just a little bit more room for me to kind of just sleep uh, uncontrollably and all over the place like I normally do. Um, so the tent's really nice and then it, it's super light. And then I have this Pluton, uh, Big Agnes Pluton ultralight 40 degree bag, um, super, super lightweight, minimal. Uh, it's a traditional mummy that they call it, but it's not necessarily 
a mummy. It doesn't really have too much of a hood. Um, it's kind of just a super minimal sleeping bag. Down, uh, works really well, packs really tight. And um, it still keeps me warm, probably. If paired with my down jacket and my long johns, down to freezing or so. Um, but I might be a little cold. And that's it in this. Um, that whole setup obviously is pretty minimal. Uh, so that is with the bag and all the stuff inside, <clears throat> excuse me, it's just under four pounds. And um, that's basically all I can fit underneath the saddle uh, saddle rails there just because I, uh, uh, I'm using a full suspension bike. Um, so yeah, crazy. A lot of different setups there. Super crazy. Yeah. Um, all right. So now going back to that question. And if you guys, I guess we can open this up now. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you guys uh, that are watching have any questions, please leave them in the comment section right here. Uh, and we'll try to highlight one of them and, uh, and answer them. But uh, who was that again? That was... Um... Zero, zero fighter? yeah, zero fighter forty two at four thirty five. So six thirty five. Oh yeah, I'm in a, I'm in a different place. <laughs> Seven thirty five. I can't see it. So what what was it again, Miles? Sorry. Um, it was just the the front oh. and rear weight balance. So pretty much, I guess we're comparing handlebar setup to saddlebag setup, and just like kind of generally what the balance is like. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess what what what's the balance in, on your bike? What do you what would you say is is most preferred? Let's um because I forgot to share my photo last time. I'll do that just because yep. then it shows the rack setup too. Um, boop, boop, boop. Is it going? There it is. Nice. So that's that's the rack setup there with the dry bag on top. And in this kind of setup, I put heavier stuff in the in the back for sure. Um, I've really started transition to keep the front of my mountain bike light when you're doing like single track, heavy trips, um, like Oregon timber trail or that Arcan Arkansas scouting or like rough trails. I find it just so much more fun to have a light front end of the bike. Mm. Um, so I used to pretty regularly have like water bottles on my fork where I'm trying to get away with not doing that. Um, partly cause I just don't want to scratch up my nice, nice new fork. And, um, I've even started to not do as many water balls and feed bags in the front either, which really takes a lot of the weight off because water is really the heaviest thing you carry. Um, yeah, so I would say maybe like 70 in the back, 40 in the front. Um, okay. Maybe if we want get, to get technical with it. Yeah, it sounds about right. What do you think, Jess? What do you do usually? Uh, because I have sort of this like specific seat pack tire rub issue i feel like i put a lot less in the back and it's a lot um, lighter and consequently i feel like my seat pack is probably the lightest of the three so like to my handle bag and seat pack you know i guess it would probably be like 30 or 40 in the back and more underneath me immediately in the frame bag and the front um which is not ideal for single track but um with the fargo you know it handles pretty well you know with the, that that Front, heavy front, um, and I can share my photo of the Fargo too because I also have all those feed bags and stuff. Mm -hmm. that tend to make that um, heavier. Can you see that? Uh, no. <laughs> hmm. Oh, there it is. There it is now. Cool. So, yeah, when you have you know, two water bottles on your fork and a feed bag up front and the handlebar bag, it gets pretty heavy up there. And that definitely has caused my bike to fall unintentionally. A lot. Sure. <laughs> it's very annoying. So I'm also trying to get away from at least having those, the stem bars or the stem bags on the handlebar. Cause that's mm -hmm. my knees and that's annoying. So, but uh, yeah, kind of try to keep that rear light just because I, I deal with a lot of that. You can even see it in the photo. There's not a ton yeah. of difference. It's tight for sure. Yeah. Joe, what do you think your balance is there? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that I'm totally with Jess on this question. I, like in, in the saddlebag, there's 
there's not very much. And I've had my bikes built that, that Rob English bike or, or my, my seven cycles tree line uh, ambassador for seven cycles. And I really appreciate their support. Rob Vandermark. Hope you're watching uh, on my expedition bike. I, I, you know, I asked them to build it so that the handling was a little fast without any, without any bags on it so that when it slowed down with a, a front roll, which is often packed, you know, really wide, basically as, as wide as my, as my, as wide as my bars, it would still handle uh, ably enough. And so I, I have to think that it's, that it's 60, 40 bias toward the front. Okay. And, and that's worked out just fine. Although I should say that, that the overall aim is to have, you know, not counting water, you know, 11 kgs of, of gear. So, so the kit doesn't am amount to very much compared to your body weight, which is already biased toward the back. And so for building wheels and for thinking about the balance of the bicycle, I I'm happy to have stuff up front. Oh, Oh, by the way, for those, of, those of you taking bets on the, on the beer, I'm drinking a, an alchemist heady topper. Uh, it is a heady topper. Um, it's a heady topper. That's <laughs> Dean said it was a heady topper. Yeah. Good, good job, Dean. Uh, some, some, of some Vermont pride. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, I guess as far as, uh, let me try to get my setup here. Share screen. Uh, okay. So that's my bike. Um, and obviously like, honestly, I, I must pack lighter than you all do, but <laughs> I, um, this is, I'm also carrying a backpack, which has a, quite a bit of things in it just because I, I just don't have um, the space on the bike, really. So you, you see that huge gap between my rear tire and the bag. I still rub up against um, up against the the tire in the bag, even with two Vole uh, uh, Wolf Tooth Vole um, or not Vole uh, Valet. Uh, that's Vol and Valet together, by the way. <laughs> um, two uh, two of those on the the dropper there. So yeah, I, I would say I probably am almost 50, 50 though. Cause I, I still don't have all that much up front. Um, and this, I mean, it's, I think we could always like, we could kind of go down the rabbit hole too of, all right, are you, are you bike packing with someone in this system? I actually ended up bike packing with another individual. We shared a tent because we knew that we were going to be hiking our bikes up just rugged terrain all day long. And so we ended up sharing a tent, a, a spacious enough tent, um, and it worked out just fine. So, so yeah, I do think I'm probably 50-50. That being said, I do have a backpack on that's pretty heavy with three liters of water in it. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. By the way, uh, Neil, I'm not sure that, that every viewer will know that that you're a rocket ship. And so like everybody else, every, everybody who's watching should Google Neil Belchenko to, no. to recognize that he goes as fast as anybody in the damn universe on <laughs> long trails. So mm -hmm. surprise, it shouldn't be surprising to anybody that you pack you pack so light and, and you're so efficient. I mean, old fat guy like me is, is you know, I don't care how long it takes me to, to, to cross uh, Ethiopia or to, to ride in Bolivia. So it's, it's a, a different set of attitudes mm -hmm. for, for packing and, and different set of values, you know, in what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think, um, yeah, it just, yeah, it's, it, everybody's a little different. Um, I, I, I think you carry some things that I probably should like even a towel, like or sometimes, first aid kit. well, first aid kit <laughs> is definitely a priority, but like having a towel, like to dry off in a, like a, a stream or whatnot, especially when it's cold it's not a bad idea all right um so do we have any other questions there, there was a good one um about vertically challenged people so just with tire rub in general um it was directed towards jess um about maybe they were late coming in to know what bag you're using um oh here we go but really in general if anyone knows yeah yeah, so if you missed it, I have the second iteration of the Revelate Designs Terrapin system. 
Um, so I really like it because it's, you know, you have the harness and then the dry bag is separate. So harness just stays on the bike, dry bag comes in and off whenever you need it. Um, and yeah, you can see I've had a lot of tire rub issues and I still ultimately default to this because I, it's the only seat pack I've ever had. I really do like it. I like the, you know, modular system. I, I think it's really easy. I think it's really seamless. You can really crank the crap out of these straps and really get it tight and not have any sway at all. Um, I've just had to refine my packing system as far as the dry bag itself. And, uh, and ultimately I, I found something that works for me, um, but definitely a lot of like trial and error in that department. And uh, yeah, it's really frustrating when you hear the, you know, yeah. thing in the morning and you pack and you rush and then you have the, the seat, seat bag hitting. It's pretty frustrating, but yeah, I mean, that works for me now, especially if I'm really, you know, on it as far as like packing and um, not rushing through it or being sloppy with it. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm also a little guy. And so, so like I'm, I'm always working with tiny packs and, and a small bicycle and the, the worst moment sitting around the campfire is, is when like the tall dudes are like, yeah, but your clothes are smaller. It's just like, no, that actually doesn't compensate for the fact that your saddlebag is is like this and my saddlebag's like this. And so I'm I'm totally right there with you, Jess. Yeah, and the frame bag, it's like the types of food you can put in your frame bag. It's just it affects everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I I also clearly remember Joe pulling out different shirts for every day of the trip that we were oh. on. So, so if anything, he should be packing bigger bags. Um, one thing to add on to that is the rear rack system too, right? So that's going to give you, it's going to eliminate that rub issue for people that really don't have any clearance at all. Um, so running like little micro panniers, there's a lot of great options out right now, uh, or, or doing the Miles Arbor dry bag situation, um, I like it. which also gives you uninterrupted dropper post use, which I forgot to kind of add in there. Um, my dropper post with my little True. setup works like it does every single day um, no added weight on it either which is pretty sweet not uh but you can't most at least you probably could maybe figure it out but not uh full suspension bike friendly no yeah there's there are some options but um yeah i haven't yeah. i haven't done it <laughs> yeah no that's fine and uh eagle tactics said that that i mean the micro panniers yeah um Good all right time. yeah and, uh let's see here what are other questions do we have curious on... okay um this is alex i think uh i'm curious what rear bags they use from uh we use for more expedition style trips instead of fast-paced gravel riding i think joe probably even has that bag especially since he, it's been on uh, throughout the world on multi-week trips um uh, but joe could you perhaps speak about a specific bag that um i guess what are the characteristics of a specific bag like that for for those types of trips yeah alex good question um and i'm going to share share a different screen this time this is this is a more expedition setup so let's see neil are you seeing that should pop up. Oh, I have to get rid of mine, right? Yeah, there we are. Yeah, so this is a, a shot taken by Logan uh, when we were scouting a route in Kyrgyzstan, a route that would later get turned into the, the Silk Road mountain race. Um, and so here, what you're looking at is day two, I think, of a, of a six day span, that six day span that I talked about where we wouldn't see resupply. And so what you're looking at is, is the front bag totally packed with basically all my stuff other than food and food is in the, in the rear bag. That rear bag is a, is a Terrapin. Uh, so a Rebel 8 Terrapin. And, you know, so I had to, I had to pack six days of food in that, that style sack. But on the other hand, Eric Parsons reports trips from Alaska where he has 10 days of food in that, in that rear bag. So that's an, another case of you trying to anticipate 
like where you have room and where what kind of bag you're gonna you're, you're gonna need to bring into the tent. So the great thing about the terrapin and a number of other bags is that you can take the the inner bag and and bring it into the vestibule of your tent and take or take mm -hmm. it in the tent. So here I've got all my food in there. I, I guess I would say to answer your question, Neil, what kind of characteristics? Well, you want it to be you want it to have as much capacity as fits between your saddle and the top of your top of your tire. And for my money, I think for a longer trip, you want to have it be removable as as easily as possible, so that if you take it into uh, an, an abandoned hut that you're spending the night in, or you, you're taking it into the tent, that that's made easy. Yeah, cool. Great info. Um, that's a good question from Manuel. I drink a lot of water. It can get heavy in addition to your other gear. How do you guys all plan on how much water you carry on trips? Uh, Miles, you want to touch on this one? Yeah. Um, it really depends on where you're going first, which is, should be pretty obvious, just kind of like what kind of terrain you're in. Um, if there's the ability to filter water pretty regularly, like um, Oregon Timber Trail, for example, in most of the sections at least, um, you can filter water pretty regularly. So you can carry less with you. Or if you're going through towns uh, very regularly as well, and you can pick up stuff along the way, then you can carry less. Generally speaking, I would say I have kind of three liters on my bike, or I can carry three liters of water on my bike pretty e easily without kind of strapping anything and keeping the weight off the front, like I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, under the down tube, for sure. That's why those down tube bottle mounts are pretty key to look out for if you're looking for a new bike. I think it's, that's just such a good place to put some like pretty heavy weight. Um, so like the lowest and most central point of your bike. So usually, usually a big clean canteen. Um, so kind of getting close to like almost two liters of water down there. And then I've started, well, and then usually I'd have a feed bag with one bottle that I can drink out of on the way. Um, I've started recently playing around with like water ball or water bladders in the frame bag, um, which is like something a lot of people do, but I've never tried it. So right now I'm trying to figure that out, which is trickier than I expected it would be just because everything is not what I'm used to. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I think I can kind of touch on that too. Uh, just, I actually can think of an instance of trying to pack as much water. Um, when Lindsay and my, uh, my partner and myself went on a trip in Utah and we, it was only a two night trip, but we needed to pack as much water because we knew we weren't going to get any water throughout the whole trip. Um, and I think it was like a 150 mile, uh, three day, or maybe it was a little bit longer, two night trip. But we, we just had to be really creative and we would use like miles, we would use uh, three liter, or at least for, for me, I would, I would try to pack at least three liters in my frame. And then I would have three liters on my back. And then I would try to use, uh, the, like any bosses on my, my frame, my down tube or on my fork, um, to try to fit as much water as possible. Uh, so obviously research is the most important thing, just knowing what kind of terrain and what kind of, um, temperature it, it's going to be how much you're actually going to need and then if you're going to actually need water for food um you know dehydrated hydrated meals actually kind of end up using a little bit more water um so just uh, there's a bunch of kind of nuances that you have to think about um especially when you go back in, into the back country sweet um all right, let's answer this one all together here has anyone ever broken a saddle rail due to a seat pack? No. Nope. No. Nope. <laughs> Not once. I'm sure somebody has out there, but uh, yeah, least... probably. I don't think it happens very often. Yeah, in fact, I can, I can add that in the in the drop bar setup that I was sharing with folks. That saddle is a is a Brooks uh, carbon rail saddle, and I've run that for a year and and no worries about it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, another good question from Joe here. Do you guys usually pack bear bags? Do most popular bike packing routes not require bear ba bear cans ever? Question mark. <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah, I would say, well, I'd say the majority of the routes, especially on bikepacking.com, don't require bear, bear cans. Like 
Um, Cause that's like, that would be, that'd be a nightmare to have to carry. Even the small ones are still like kind of big. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. I, I, we carried one on my partner and I, when we rode the great divide, but only through um, that kind of Canada section. Yeah, you know. and you carried a can, or did you? Yeah, a oh, can. Oh, okay. I didn't carry it because my bike is not large enough. Yeah, <laughs> partner did that, but uh, yeah, and it's super clunky and it sucks, and uh, yeah, it was. Um, but it was kind of softer, and we were able to like toss it up in a tree, and it, you know, I feel like we did our part. We didn't see a bear, so we saw a dead bear cub. So I'm mm. glad we had it, but yeah, it was kind of a pain. Um, I think maybe I've always just been paranoid, but, um, I, so when I'm racing, I don't do anything, which is silly and racing is just dangerous. But when I'm, um, bike packing with others or by myself, I almost always get my, get a, especially a, uh, like a, uh, a holster system, a holster front bag or rear bag. Uh, I pack the dry bag with all the food and I don't sleep with it at all. I, uh, I would either maybe hang it up in a tree or um, chuck it somewhere a little bit further away from, from the tent. Um, and that's especially when I was living in Colorado, especially in a, uh, a town that had frequent bear activity. Uh, I knew they were around. I knew they were, they were accustomed to human food. They, at least a lot of them knew what human food was. So they are then more susceptible to sniffing out a familiar scent. So uh, I would definitely just be a little bit more cautious and just not sleep with it. So yeah, not a bear, not a bear can, but I would put it all in one place and, and put it away from my tent. Yeah. They make like bear bags that are like kind of terror resistant. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, they would hold up against a bear. Really. Yeah. It's a nice thought. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, Joe, do you have anything to say about bears? Uh, I, I mostly ride routes that don't require them. And I worry about the day when I do ride such a route. <laughs> Perfect. I, I do the same thing as you, Neil. Yeah. I just keep I just feel a little bit better doing oh, it. Oh, yeah. There's be bears in BC, and they want to eat me. Well, and grizzlies are a different story. And if you can somehow, like, put the bear bag downwind, then they then that's you're a little bit less susceptible to having an encounter, you know? So they won't even go by your tent. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Someone added in the comments there, it's Ursac that makes, Jess, that was that bag you were talking about. Yeah. Um, which is it's that's a good option. It's kind of like a more durable option than like yeah. a dry bag. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess Joe did mention there are some parks that require them. Yeah, some national national parks do require them. Absolutely. Um, we, yeah. Sweet. Um, cool. Any other questions? Can we? Can we? Can I just say something about uh, uh, Andres's question? Andres Gonzalez is asking <laughs> anything you like to strap on your seat bag besides. <laughs> Novel mug. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> we urge you not to do that, Andres. Uh, he like resists the dangle as much as you, like you're gonna turn into Cass Gilbert with all kinds of junk hanging off, <laughs> of your and looking like some crazy hippie. Just, just, just have your bags. Put it in the bags. If you need more space, run panniers. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. If you if you look in the fine print of the bike packing collective um, sign up form, you'll actually see that we say you can't dangle anything. Uh, <laughs> so you might want to revisit that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> um, speaking of which, let me get rid of this comment. Um, so yes, yeah, so the bike packing collective. I know that um, the new bike packing journal is about to come out, and uh, Jess, you have a piece in the new bike packing journal can you give us a little uh little hint as to what it might be um well if you were tuned in earlier i mentioned my latest bike packing trip was on the trans virginia which is relatively new um it was developed a couple years ago and it starts in washington dc and it takes bike paths and gravel roads all the way to the virginia tennessee border it's about 550 miles um, and Virginia is my home state. So of course I had to do it. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of a different story for me. It's not like about, I don't 
go into it expecting a play-by-play of the route by any means. Um, it's kind of more about just kind of, you know, assessing my own uh, implicit biases and um, and how bike packing is kind of helping me address those and, and how, yeah, I can ride through a state that feels super familiar to me and still kind of, you know, be confronted with things that I don't necessarily approve of or I'm uncomfortable with and, and what that does for me. So, um, so that's kind of, yeah, you know, awesome. yeah, it's good, good practice in uh, being honest and, uh, and holding myself accountable. So it's cool. Rad. Cool. And that journal should be uh, hitting doorsteps actually relatively soon. Do you know exactly when miles? Um, I forgot the date. Logan will comment in the comments, but we're definitely, we're wrapping up the design of everything this weekend. Um, so yeah, awesome. I forgot the date though. Rad. And if you, uh, we'll put a, a little note in the, uh, the comment or the, uh, the, yeah, comment section, I guess right now about, um, joining the, uh, the bike packing collective. Cause on top of the journal, there's a bunch of rewards and exclusive, co uh, gear and whatnot that you can, uh, that you can receive. So it's, it's pretty awesome. And you're helping support, um, journalism and just uh, some some rad people. So wonderful. Um, anything else from you guys? I think what we're on an hour and six minutes. Does, is there any other questions? Eagle Tactics. There's, there's a few, but they're not. Uh, oh, prints on Monday, the journal prints on Monday. Prints on Monday, sweet. Um, well, so so not to not to not to be uh, a a tease for future episodes, but a number of comments, a number of questions have asked about what how we we handle the rest of our setup. Are we wearing a backpack or or how do, how we think about the frame bag? And so that's coming up. And and Neil, I, I'm I'm I know you're about to inter to invite readers to to tune in next week and the weeks after. So. We promise that we're going to talk about the rest of our setups. And if you're scoring at home, write down what we claimed was in our seat bag to make sure that when yeah. we're done in a month, we have all the things we claim that we had because we don't want to smuggle in stuff that, that was never presented to you. Yeah. <laughs> How about this? How about we put all of our stuff in the description below once this publishes on YouTube um, and then everybody can kind of keep track. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. Cool. All right, guys. Well, guys and ga gals, thank you so much for um, joining me and, and being a part of this awesome uh, YouTube Live, the first one ever. Um, yeah, so next, uh, next Thursday, we're going to uh, be live again at 7 Eastern. And um, yeah, uh, we'll talk about frame bags and what's in our frame bags and, and the varieties of frame bags out there, because I know we all have different ones. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much. And, um, if you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comment section below. Uh, I, we still can, can obviously answer those, uh, when we're not live here. If you have yet to do so already, please hit that subscribe button that will ensure all of our videos pop up in your feed. Uh, super important just so that you can always be on top of all of our videos that are published. Um, yeah. And until next time, pedal further. Bye, gang. Yeah. yeah.